Hey, Dr. C here with you. I want to talk about the five most misleading nutrient tests. You know, it's a good thing that more practitioners think about the importance of nutrients and more are testing for them. But the testing is not straightforward. There are some really big pitfalls. And here's five of the biggest ones I don't want you to fall victim to. First one is calcium. Now, this is part of pretty much every blood test that gets done. It's part of a, a, what's called a chem panel. It's called a SMAC back in the day. But most blood tests will include a serum calcium. Two big problems with this. First one is that there's no direct connection between your dietary calcium and your serum calcium. Not, not never, but extremely unlikely. And I've seen many times to where someone is told they should consume less calcium because their blood levels of calcium are high. Or I've seen the opposite. There's a popular trend to think that everyone should be in the center of the range. That's just not true. You know, there's a many times in which if a population is healthy, range is normal. And there's nothing really bad about being on one end of that versus the other. Almost like imagine that, let's say you wanted to detect people that were short of stature because you wanted to catch those that were undernourished. That's valid and you could do that. But let's say you grabbed a bunch of uh, basketball players and measured them and averaged them and grabbed all the ones that were on the short side of normal. They wouldn't be malnourished. <laughs> They're probably still 6'5", right? But they're shorter than average in that group. And that's the same thing for many blood markers. So calcium, it's regulated by so many mechanisms between the bones, the gut, the kidneys, the parathyroids, that it doesn't go up and down in response to how much you're consuming. And many doctors don't understand that. Other big thing about calcium is that it's always a problem when it's high, and it can be a problem even when it's high normal. So in terms of numbers, uh, most labs say that 10.4 nanograms per mil is the upper limit for serum calcium. However, if you're above 9.8 consistently, there can be something wrong. So that's in the normal range. But if you're on that higher side of it, there can be a problem with calcium. It doesn't mean you're drinking too much milk. <laughs> it means your body is not regulating calcium correctly. And that's a big deal. The most common cause of that is parathyroid disease. Next most common cause is a hidden malignancy. So high calcium is always a big deal. You never want to ignore that. Next big one that's misleading is iron. And two problems with iron. First one is that there's a lot of ways to measure it, and a lot of doctors don't really know how to check a full panel properly. Uh, it can look normal even when it is well below optimal. So it does take having a full panel done but also knowing some context. When all the various iron markers, the binding capacity, the transferrin, the percent saturation, the red cell, the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, the ferritin, when they all sync up in ways that are simple, then ferritin can be one of the earliest indicators of a lack of iron. The drawback is the normal range of ferritin goes all the way down to, in some cases, single digits. But many with thyroid disease can be symptomatic even when ferritin is well within the normal range. Now, the other wrinkle about iron is that it is an acute phase reactant. We're going to talk about this again with vitamin D, but a lot of ways your body shifts your chemistry when you're sick that aren't necessarily why you're sick. <laughs> so what happens is when someone has an inflammatory response, their ferritin levels may elevate. This is really common with fatty liver. So ferritin is a stored form of iron and mostly is storing it in the liver. So when the liver gets too congested, too built up with fat, it can also hold on to extra iron. And in some cases that can occur even when someone is iron deficient. They may be lacking iron elsewhere, but have too much of it in, in one spot. And I've seen often where doctors misconstrue that to be a case of an iron overload. It may not be. So iron can be an acute phase reactant, and it can be pushed around for reasons that have nothing to do with iron levels. Uh, next big one is manganese. Now, there's a lot of popular nutrient panels that check a big variety of nutrients. I'm going to talk about those as a whole in a separate video. Many of those include manganese. And people are told they're lacking in manganese when they're on the lower side of the normal range. Now, this is kind of like that NBA argument. No one's manganese deficient. There have been a few extremely rare genetic defects in which people don't metabolize manganese properly, but no one's been documented to be deficient in manganese ever. So once a test says you're low in manganese, that's a red flag. That's like the guy trying to sell you the Golden Gate Bridge. 
And I, I have no doubt that the test uh, testing people and that the doctor, that they're all sincere, but it's just not true. And there are some concerns about manganese overload, especially with thyroid disease. So don't buy the Golden Gate Bridge and don't take manganese because your tests say you're low in it. <laughs> they actually sold the um, shoot, the Brooklyn Bridge. There's a fun story about that. It was sold many, many times. But the problem was, the, the story was, they this person would sell it and say, look, you can buy the bridge and you can charge a toll on everyone going across the bridge because you own it. <laughs> and so the cops would come out and they would see some poor person who was misled and they set up their toll booth on what they thought was their bridge. And the cop was like, it's not your bridge. You can't have a toll booth. You got to go home. <laughs> so yeah, don't do that. Uh, next up is vitamin D. This is a really big one, and this is important for a couple of reasons. So like iron, this is an acute phase reactant. Unlike iron, it is a negative acute phase reactant. What does that mean? Well, it means when you're sick, vitamin D goes down. Now, for a lot of years, we thought that vitamin D was the reason behind like every illness. And here's how that played out. There was more studies looking at people that had you know, chronic pain, arthritis, diabetes, can cancers, you name it, any condition you could shake a stick at, if you measured their vitamin D, they were probably lower than similar people who didn't have that same disease. And, you know, we want to find solutions. We want to find easy answers to these big questions. So it was a natural, it wasn't a big leap to say maybe low vitamin D was a problem. And wouldn't it be cool if we could just give vitamin D and fix all these problems? What happened was, more and more studies were done giving vitamin D and filing, finding it didn't help the condition. So one great recent example has been COVID infectious risk. Tons of papers show that people who get COVID or get very sick from COVID are lower in vitamin D than their peers are. But now we've had many clinical trials saying, if we take people who are sick and give them vitamin D, they don't get better. It doesn't improve more than they would otherwise. And why is that? Well, when you're sick, your vitamin D goes down. It's an acute phase reaction. It's a normal response in the body. It might even be an adaptation. It might be random. It might be meaningless. But it's not the same as low vitamin D making you sick. Now, imagine you were a, an alien. You were coming to Earth, and you were flying over London, and you saw that all these umbrellas would come out when it was raining. You might think the umbrellas caused the rain, but they don't. <laughs> they show up when it's raining, but they're not causing the rain. And we now know low vitamin D is kind of like that. That's not to say that vitamin D is not helpful. And it's not to say that there are those that cannot benefit from it. There are those who are too low in it. And it does have important roles to play in the body. But all this big, long list of things that's been purported to do haven't really panned out because now we know it's an acute phase reactant. It just showed up because there's something going on. It's not the cause of what's going on. The other big wrinkle about vitamin D is there's two different units. There's nanograms per mil and there's nanomoles per liter. The latter is used in Europe and also in a great deal of medical research. So when studies are done in vitamin D, they'll often use nanomoles per liter. However, when you go to the friendly neighborhood lab in the States and you get your blood drawn, your report's probably gonna be nanograms per mil. It won't be the same units. Now, what's happened is a lot of health experts have seen recommendations for vitamin D to be in the 75 to 120 range. And they've just taken that and run with it. They've said your vitamin D should be 70 to 100, 75 to 125. You'll see numbers like that all the time. That came from the European units. And that's totally true for the European units. But those aren't the units you're gonna get on your blood test in the United States. So what happens to people is that they think they need to take this massive dose that they don't because they're going off of the wrong units. So the European units to the US units, it's a factor of 2.5. So that 75 to 125, that's actually like 30 to 50 in our nanograms per mil that we get our blood test done in the United States. I'm not making it up. It's that It was that simple of an error at first, but that's where these high targets of vitamin D came from, from people miss not converting the units into our units here. So you do need it. And that 75 to 125 is a totally good range, only if you're talking about nanomoles per liter. <laughs> yeah, these differences make a big, big difference. And last up for misleading tests would be iodine. And this one is so logical. You know, 
the poor thyroid health consumer hears me talking about iodine being dangerous in excess, and it hears other doctors saying that you need tons of it, you should bathe in it basically, and they think, well, why don't I just test my levels and see where I'm at? That is so logical. Now, iodine shows up in the thyroid, the blood, and the urine. Those three areas, they actually don't have that much to do with one another. The blood is probably the least useful. The blood only shows changes if you're getting so much that it's about to damage your kidneys. That's only when blood levels of iodine elevate. I've seen a lot of times to where a doctor tests their patient's blood level of iodine, finds them low, gives them iodine supplements, and they don't get any higher. And they're like, oh my goodness, they were really deficient. I got to give them a higher dose. And what happens is either they finally get high and now they've got problems, or they just never really elevate because, well, they wouldn't. That's not how blood levels of iodine work. The other big problem are the urinary tests. They are good gauges for iodine status, but only for large numbers of people. They have no relationship whatsoever for a given person. Now, the one, the one way they can is if you do a lot of tests. And by a lot, this is totally impractical. You need more than 200 24-hour urine tests or more than 300 random urinary tests to be within 90% predictive value. They're totally worthless. So this is a case to where how much you get, you evaluate that based upon what your sources are and how well your thyroid is working. Those are the better ways to know about that. So those are the top five misleading tests, uh, calcium, iron, manganese, vitamin D, and iodine. It's important to be aware of your nutritional status and to get things right, but you don't want to get steered in the wrong direction along the way. And that's why I wanted to share this with you. All right, Dr. C with you. Take great care, and I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.